we start talking about the state capitol, and of course this morning's sessions were primarily on design, architecture, um, site planning, um, kind of civic center planning, but we didn't want to lose sight of the fact that the purpose of a capital is to legislate and to govern and to be a, a place where decisions are made about um, how we live and work together. So the legislative history is also an important part of this story of the last 50 years. So we've invited a panel to come and tell us the highlights reel. Um, and rather than have just sort of a, a timeline or a recitation, we, we really wanted them to tell us some stories. So who better to do that than journalists? So we have invited Robbie Dingman, who is editor at Honolulu Magazine, Richard Bereka um, from the now the Honolulu Star Advertiser, and Carolyn Tanaka, who is currently director of communications at the State House of Representatives, but is also a former journalist with um, the television stations. And I know I told you I would let you introduce yourselves, but I think I just did it. So um, Robbie will be um, facilitating this panel. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we thought we'd just start it off by talking a little bit about how we first encountered the state capitol. Uh, beyond, I think my first one and yours too, probably Carolyn would be as a student on a field trip. Uh, beyond that, I believe uh, it was coming back here uh, as a, I first came here as a reporter for the Honolulu Star Bulletin. And um, it was both daunting and exciting to be here, but I'll let my colleagues tell them about their first experience. Well, actually, in preparing for this, I realized that um, this building has been a part of my, my life, and especially my professional life. So I went to St. Andrew's Priory School right across the street. So when this building was being built, I was in high school, but I didn't really know it, what the hell it was because I was in high school and it didn't really matter to me. And then I, I was in, in session hire here when I was 18 or 19, and I was still bored. Um, and then I became a reporter and I covered the building and then I went to work for Governor Waihe'e as his press secretary and so I lived in the building for eight years. And then um, private sector lobbied here or did communications here, university lobbied here for the university and now I work for the House of Representatives. So I guess this has always been my home. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I started at the uh, Star Bulletin back in 1971. Uh, I worked at nights and uh, start work at three o'clock in the afternoon and, and write your story and finish it by 10 o'clock and go home and come back the next day. No, we, 10 o'clock you go out and have lots of drinks. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things is that you would have to cover night hearings at the, at the Capitol. I don't think they even have night hearings anymore, but they did have night hearings. And so the new kid would get to cover the night hearings, usually on the university bait, beat or something that you sort of knew about because you went to UH. Um, then uh, one of the political reporters from the, uh, in the day, I believe it was Tom Kaufman, uh, said, what do you think about this place? What do you think about this building? And I said, I don't know, it's just, just another building. And he said, good, that's what, that's what we want. We want a reporter who comes over here and is not awed by the Capitol. Even though secretly I was thinking, my God, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been in. Uh, and you look at the, one of the jokes you hear early on about the state Capitol after it was built was that uh, the COA in here, uh, Jack Burns single-handedly revived the COA wood industry by building the state Capitol. <laughs> But it's a it's a gorgeous it's a gorgeous interior to this to this building. Um, that said, when we talk about some of the legislation uh, of the Capitol and the historic Hawaii uh, did a tremendous job of going through all the different key points of legislation in the last 50 years. That's a yeoman's job. Thank you for doing that, because uh, I'm going to steal from it. Uh, but. If you look early on, the early legislation uh, coming out of this building was all about making Hawaii a state. It was the growing pains of Hawaii. The, you looked in, in there was uh, funding for the stadium, which had not been built. $27 million of what it cost to uh, build the stadium. Um, 
the authorization for a second UH campus in Leeward, Oahu. The new penal code was completely rewritten um, in the early years of, of the state capitol. Um, the most important bill I think that the legislature ever passed was prepaid health insurance for the state of Hawaii. And that came early in 1972, I believe, uh, 1974. Um, then more funding for West Oahu. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs was uh, created by the Constitutional Convention in 78, but it was the enabling legislation came in 1979. And that was all pivotal to, this, to the early new state of Hawaii. And there was a feeling then that I don't think we have now that, uh, that and I thought of it, it sort of embraces the, the openness of, of the state capital. It was the, the confidence that uh, Hawaii as a new state had in uh, the 60s and the 70s. We can do it. We can do it. And we can be a model for the rest of the country. Um, I don't think we have that same kind of confidence now, but the uh, ability to, the earlier speakers who talked about the civic, civic plan for downtown Honolulu and the confidence of being able to not only ad, uh, imagine it, but then implement it. Um, and that, that's something that we could certainly see a lot more of. But that, I, I've talked too much already. So. I think one of the interesting things that you touched on, though, is that a lot of the times from that early time, so I came a little bit later. I came as a reporter also working at night at the Star Bulletin uh, in 1983. First, I was an intern, the intern who never went home, so I, they hired me. And so uh, I used to come to the same night hearings as well. And I think one of the things what, that struck me when we were looking through the more extensive uh, uh, timeline that we were given was how many firsts there were. I mean, and we were, I sort of, in the 80s, got used to, oh yeah, we're the first in the nation to uh, pass legalized safe abortion. We're the first in the nation to have prepaid health care. And then, then as years wore on, it, it became more clear how unusual that was. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I, mm -hmm. during my whole lifetime, raised by a mom from the Big Island, dad who was in the military, it was the feeling that Hawaii could always do it best. We just needed some time, and we were going to get there. And I believe we, I, I don't know, I don't see as much of, do you see as much of that now? Uh, you, you know what, I think that there was a time when I felt like everybody else, that we had just stagnated from, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the optimism in the mm -hmm. beginning to the doldrums, um, maybe even today. But I must say that um, in the House of Representatives this past election, we elected 10 new members. They range in age, it's the youngest I think is 34, got a bunch of 40s, 50s, and even a 60-something year old. And in, since I've been here s since 2013, I have noticed a changing of the guard, the passing of the baton. Um, and with the election of these 10 kids, 10 kids, these freshmen, <laughs> You know, me and the 60-year-old were okay, but... <laughs> hanging with, on the back. I know, hanging on the back, still hanging on. Um, but our freshman lawmakers, representatives in the House, so far I've, I've been very impressed with them, very impressed with their thinking, and it makes me, it holds out hope. It makes me optimistic, because we are. It is, the faces are changing. Richard said he can't even recognize some of them here anymore. And that's understandable because Richard is very old. <laughs> um, but there, so I, I am holding out hope that maybe this is the millennials will do what, you know, the, the us baby boomers did with such vigor and enthusiasm. So I am optimistic. And they better prove me right, Brian. <laughs> I think one of the things that, um, Richard, I want you could, well, let's talk a little bit about the design of the Capitol and how it works in, because I do think we, we were talking outside a little bit about how the design is such that it is open to the public and it is open to all of us who were always looking for people and stories. How did well, it work so the, for us? Uh, the first realization that the big broad lanai's and the fact that every office has only one front door and no back door to it, um, makes 
a real key thing that I don't think any other state capital has. Um, and the first time I heard about this, or, or it came into focus for me, was early on when they were organizing a s session of the legislature in maybe 74. Uh, it's one of those things when, uh, who's gonna be the speaker? We don't know who's gonna be the speaker. You trade these votes, I'll trade those votes for that back and forth and little factions form and dis dissolve and come back together in different groups of people supporting different people for speaker. So um, Richard Garcia was a young, wily uh, state representative who was very, very ambitious and was putting together a coalition of other young uh, legislators. Um, Watch the, your guys do this. Uh, and uh, one of the things he did is he had an aide who said, okay, I want you to just stand here on the railing and tell me who comes in and out of Dickie Wong's office. <laughs> so all I want to know, just, who, just write down who comes in and out of Dickie Wong's office, because he was in the state house then and he was helping to organize the, the house. And that was the kind of openness that you could see. And it, to this day, uh, the function of hanging on the rail is uh, a part of the life at the state capitol where you can watch, you can watch who's going in, what lobbyists just went in to meet with the Speaker of the House. Uh, what delegation of dissident Democrats just went to go meet with those Republicans down around the corner. Uh, and all that then becomes um, uh, food for uh, stories in, in the future and also for tips on what's actually happening. I do think that one of the things that sort of supersedes being able to do that in person is social media. I think a lot of that stuff is now uh, accomplished uh, uh, on social media and with Instagram and such and such that it, it, it changes sort of the political debate of, of the legislature. But one of the things that I always remember early on, um, when Dickie Wong was the early Senate president, for a half hour before the session started, he would essentially hold court uh, on the railing. And he would go out there and sort of sun himself and uh, listen to whoever was coming by with an idea. You know, different senators were able to come up to him out in the public and just say, you know, Dickie, why don't we do this? Or how come we're not doing this? How come my bill is stuck in that committee? What are you gonna do about it? And, and you got to sort of weigh what was the temperature of the Senate by watching what Wong was doing that way. And, and the nice thing is that it wasn't in the back office. It, they hadn't slithered in through the back. They were doing it out there on the, the uh, COA railing. And, and that was a more fractious time when his coalition was built of Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. as well. That's right. So that was very interesting to see that happen. The rail, of course, is great in so many ways, although we were complaining earlier about if you're interviewing somebody on the rail, everyone can see you. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes your competitors, if they're less ethical about some things, might sidle up to people and say, what did she just ask you? And you were just like, hey, that's not really fair. But there's a great thing about the openness in that you do get to see, the, as you said, the lobbyists, you get to see the people talking, and you get to see how things come together. I mean, you can also get a little bit buried in that. Um, I remember one time a famous uh, lobbyist, uh, Wally, um, ha I, would do, I was doing stories about the duty-free shoppers contract. So I found out about all of the other cities that had off-site stores, and I did the background on it because I was covering the story day in and day out. And the lobbyist at the time was very powerful went into the hearing, and even though I'd done all the critical stories that he didn't like, he spent the whole hearing praising me, good old Robbie Dingman, like he used that term 10 times. And then afterward, he came out on the rail and leaned over and said, I buried you in there, didn't I? And I said, yes, sir, you did. And so, so you can be publicly humiliated as well. And one of the lighthearted ways that I was somewhat publicly humiliated was when I first went into television. Like Richard, they hired me because I knew something about state government, not because I knew anything about being on television. And I apologize for my cold. I sound froggier than usual. But uh, one of our great uh, cameramen whom we worked with at the time was very talented, would do beautiful, shoot beautiful stories. He decided to try to frame me up in a very nice way. So I was standing on the Capitol and I was saying my important words. And the, in the stand-up, the other upper floors of the Capitol are coming out of my ears. <laughs> quite wonderful. Yeah, she, lo she looked like the flying nun. <laughs> <laughs> These two guys, these are, um, Richard covered the, has covered politics in the state since 
before everybody, anybody in this room was born. It was a state. It was, <laughs> it was always, a, I didn't cover territorial politics. Very good. <laughs> he came over from Texas, y'all, so. Any, but so my memories or my recollections of this building, I mean, I covered the building as a reporter, but not like these two guys. I mean, they were stationed here. This was their beat. My memories of this building, I think, or at least the ones I can still remember, come from my years um, working for the governor as his, uh, Waihe'e as his press secretary and as his communications director. One of the things I remember about this building, um, I don't know if any of you will remember, but in 1993, January of 1993, it was the 100th anniversary of the overthrow. Mm. And so we were in a meeting with the governor. We were going through um, his, uh, you know, what appearances he would be making during that, that time of um, commemoration. And we're going through the speeches that he would be giving and what, you know, what we wanted to say. And it was very, very important to him because he was the first governor, uh, first Native Hawaiian governor. He was also, I don't know if, people probably tended to forget after a while, but, but John Waihe'e was an, one of the early Hawaiian activists, along with people like Henry Peters and Frenchie De Soto. He was part of the first, of the first group of the um, Protect Kaho Olave Ohana. And so he still had this activist, you know, thing in him. So we're sitting down there, and now remember, I'm his PR person, we're trying to figure out you know, what we should say, and it's very important that we get it right. And he said, I'm gonna take down, what do you think about taking down the American flags over all the state buildings? Mm -hmm. And a couple of his advisors were right on. Yes, yes. And they were all Native Hawaiian, and then, a couple of the Asian guys were a bit like, oh, Jesus, God, no, Governor. And then I, as his PR person, said, Governor, if you do it, there's going to be backlash. There are going to be people that are, who are going to be very, very upset with that. We will likely make the national news because Howleys are go on the mainland are going to get really pissed off at you. We did it anyway. And we, there was backlash locally. There were stories on the mainland. I think we weathered it. It was tough, but we weathered it. One year later, my husband and I, we were in DC for the inauguration of uh, Bill Clinton. We were sitting in a bar in, in our hotel, and there was a guy sitting next to us, and we struck up a conversation. And you know, the first thing is like, where are you from? <clears throat> So we said, we're from Hawaii, and he said, that governor of yours, what a guy. He must have, so, uh, he must have some cojones <laughs> to take down the American flag on the annexation. And then his friend came, who he was waiting for, and so he was about to leave, and so at the end of the conversation, we introduced ourselves, and so we said, I, I'm Carolyn, this is David. And he said, I'm Julian. And I looked at him and I went, Bond? Julian Bond? And he said, yep. And he walked away. <laughs> and I looked at my husband and I said, David, Julian Bond, a civil rights icon, uh -huh. said that our governor has balls. <laughs> <laughs> but taking down the flag over all the state buildings and coming and seeing the flags and only the Hawaiian flag flying was something that I will always remember about this building. You know, as far as the, the, the uh, sidebar to that is when they had to shut down the Capitol in, what was it, 91? I think so. What's for Where's the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they, they moved out of the Capitol for four years um, go, to rid it of 92. asbestos and to fix it all, fix it all up. Uh, and, so during that time, they, the state had created, bought, built the state office tower just down the, the corner on uh, Baratania, and they never put up a flagpole. So for four years, our state capital didn't have a flagpole. 
They may have had a flag at the top. I don't think so. But uh, we didn't have a flagpole out front to fly any flags. Well, th that was a time. I mean, moving. I was so we were in office when we. That's mm -hmm. right. When we moved out, and it was a major, major event. And we moved out because of the asbestos. Right. Yeah. They needed to clean out the asbestos. And then they built, what did we call it? The state office tower, or yeah. it, it was Leo called. Papa. Yeah. Come in, man. Right. Mm -hmm. And then everybody called it the SOT. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to the SOT, the state office tower. And can you imagine from this building, this magnificent building, we moved into the SOT, which was like this, nine floors or something like that. And it fit the Senate chambers, the House of Representatives, the governor's office. I can't remember where we put Ben, the, who, was, who was lieutenant governor at that time. Do you? On a no. different floor, I'm guessing. Yeah. No. <laughs> but it was a major, and we never moved back. I mean, so we left, the, our administration left, and we never moved back into this magnificent building again, which is something that I will always be sad about. But uh, Ben moved back in. He moved back yeah, in. Ben moved back in. Yeah. But it was it, it was an event to I move out of this building, and and it was not and was, if I it was controversial then, right? Oh, it's it was very controversial. I, I I did discover that instead of hanging out on the rail and getting your stories by seeing who's, who's who, you just stood in the elevator all day long, <laughs> and watched people come in and out of the elevator. And you said, oh, they're going up here. But it was seven floors of climbing the steps if you wanted to hurry up and get to one place to another and not wait for the next elevator to come. It was, it was an irritating building to have to work in. Yeah, and it certainly, I, I think it certainly cut down on the, um, the openness that this building mm -hmm. has. And I just wanted, Richard brought up the no back doors. Yeah. Why Hei was, I think he, he's, he, he loved being a legislator more than he liked being executive. He, he liked the wheeling and dealing. I, I don't know, Senator Taniguchi, were you, well, you got, you know, you were younger than him, right? Same, the same, year. same year. So <laughs> he liked, he, he, loved, he liked the legislative life. And so no back door, but, and I hope I'm not telling a secret, uh, reps and senator, um, on the fourth floor at least, there are lanais. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when, when Wahe was governor, he would love to, where, where are we going? Fourth floor, why? Cause, and so, <laughs> and that's the way he'd, um, we'd go walk along the lanais and go visit the lawmakers and, and sat down and talk story. You never see us, huh? The other part of that is that's where you could go smoke. Yes, yes. And absolutely. He was a, and he was a sneaky smoker. He didn't want to be photographed smoking. No. But it, it was sometimes that we could find him that way because we knew he'd take another lap around the block so he could smoke. Well, but he, he would also close the door on us because they, there is the private elevator that they can lock, yes. the lawmakers and the yes. uh, governor can lock. Yes. But sometimes we'd be chasing him with a camera to ask him a question, how he was reacting. <clears> and <throat> occasionally he'd be closing the door on us. And one time he closed the door on us and he saw the camera was rolling and my mom and his mom knew each other and he knew that was a rude thing to do. So he closed the door and then he opened it back up and he said, bye. <laughs> so that was the, that, that was the power of television. He, it doesn't matter if on, tele on print if I write that and then they close the elevator door. But if you show that on uh, TV, it's a powerful statement. And politicians know not to do that if the camera's rolling. Um, you know, one thing that's, that's interesting, uh, compare and contrast what's happened to the government in the state of Hawaii. Uh, when this building was built and when I first started working here, on the fourth floor on the Diamond Head Malka Corner was the Attorney General's office. And that part of the fourth floor was all of the Attorney General's offices. On the fourth floor on the Mackay Wing was the Department of Budget and Finance. Literally, there was a big safe there. Uh, you could get your paychecks cashed there. The director of BNF was there. The tax department was very small and was right next to it. Now, all those departments have empires. They don't have just half of the fourth floor of the state capitol. So that's how much uh, uh, the state has grown. In fact, I, 
I think there was a time when the budget was less than a billion dollars. Now it's many, 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 many billions. Yeah. That was a while ago. I mean, <coughs> there are things interesting about the openness of the building because you could also see protests. You can also yeah. um, oh, see. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful building for, for a protest. It's just excellent. The, the, <laughs> the rallies you could have down there um, and the difficulty we all had estimating crowd sizes. And I think we've all given up and just asked the sheriffs to give us a number. Uh, and let, the, let them be in, in charge of it. Because I even tried getting up on the fourth floor, and looking down there and going like this and saying, okay, da, 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 da. okay that's 100 people. Okay, well, this, this, like this, like this, like this, like that. And it, you can't do it. It's hard to grid count. I mean, I've tried to do it too. Yeah. And there are times that you can if you freeze the frame. Mm. But oh. still, it's, it's difficult. And, but it is interesting and, and kind of wonderful that the, everybody you can see below of when you go upstairs, you can get wonderful photographs. You can see, but you can also see and hear them. You can hear the chanting. I mean, some of the Hawaiian activists, mm -hmm. you could hear the words echoing and reverberating through the upper floors. And I mean, to me, that sounds corny, but I think that's what a government building should do. It should be inviting its people in. Absolutely, and that, that's the beauty of this building. I've only been to um, two other state capitals, um, Louisiana and Kentucky, so you know. But, uh, and, and, and <laughs> beautiful, beautiful capitals. I mean, Kentucky, there's a, they've got a bust of the colonel. I mean, <laughs> and they got, they've got a lot of busts all over the place. But, and, but beautiful capitals. Those southern states love their state capitals. They love they're, their they're chicken polished, and um, yeah. they're, they love their busts. Mm -hmm. um, but but they're, they're not conducive, the buildings are not conducive to having legislators hear the people. You can't hear them from their offices. But here, if you're in the rotunda, I mean, these guys, we can hear everything that's happening. So this building, rest assured, if you're out there and you're protesting, your lawmakers are definitely hearing your words. I will say one thing that happened since I was first a reporter here that's been really great and the legislature should get a lot of credit for is the website. It's amazing um, for giving, uh, submitting testimony, reading what's going on, finding out the status of everything. And I think that's a part of openness that's really uh, gone by leaps and bounds in a better way. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely, it's just definitely, really definitely. well done. So you've heard us talk about various things and we could go on for a while, I'm sure, but are, does anyone have any questions? that you'd like us to answer, or? Yes, Andrea. Uh, do we have the only public access room in, in the United States? Can you talk a little about that for people who may not know about the public access room? Can you repeat the question? Yes, she wants to know um, about our public access room and if a little bit about it, and if we are the only um, legislature that has it. I can tell you a little bit, I, I, don't, I, I wish Parr was here because they, yes, from what I understand, what I've been told, we are the only state that has a public access room like that. Um, and what do you mean like that? Tell them a little bit about how it operates. Somebody well, here doesn't know. Well, see, maybe somebody here could do a better explanation probably. than I can, but it is, it, it, you probably can do a better job in explaining it than I can as well. But um, it's, it's a room, it's open, you can come, you can um, look up legislation, you can type up testimony, you can um, find out what's going on, what hearings are going on, um, and it's a free room that the public has access to and, is, and has, they can use whatever, the computers and do all of that. It's, it's, it is the, the only one in this country, and I wish I knew more about it, but text me and I'll send you the info. Fourth, fourth floor, <laughs> or these guys will report side. on it. Yeah, fourth it, floor, Mackay, Mackay side, right, like two doors down from the elevator. Um, and they have a wonderful website as well, so you can go in through the website, find out about it too. Yes, yes, they do training, they, thank you for reminding me. They do, they go um, every year before the session, they go to all the neighbor islands and they hold um, training, very, a, a bunch of training sessions on each island and here on Oahu. And so the next time we send out a press release on it, I'm sure that all of you will call in more, especially will be really interested in the, um, in the uh, our, our training sessions, Colin. You're welcome. 
Yes, there are. Let's see. Okay, so here we have Governor. We did sort of the greatest hits. Well, the, and you should be interested, right? 1994, that was when same-sex marriage was uh, ruled in, the, in Hawaii as only between a man and a woman. And that was the same year Governor Cayetano became the first Filipino-American to serve as governor. Can I? Just, sure. I wanted to, 1994, same-sex marriage was, it was, it was between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. I am extremely, extremely honored and proud to say that in 2013, my first session here as the communications director for the House of Representatives, we passed same-sex marriage. And so it took a long time in coming, but it came. And it just goes to show you, and Richard and, and, and Robbie can talk about it, things and politics, it, it's kind of a circular thing. It never, there's a never ending loop. You know, you either come back to the same place that you were before or you advance. And in, as far as that issue is concerned, we certainly did advance. Yeah, and it was mm -hmm. interesting going through it. We saw some of the other, the first as they go along beyond. First woman? Yep, so we have. There first Republican go. woman? So, and you saw for, okay, so same sex marriage is out uh, then, and then domestic relationships come in in 97. And then uh, a state funeral of is, that was also one of the largest funerals here. Uh, Governor Burns was one of the largest one, but uh, 10,000 people came when um, is lay in state. So again, I thought that was an example of the people's capital. Uh, this is 1998, the uh, changing the compensation for trustees of charitable estates. This is first woman governor, Governor Lingle. Homelessness starts cropping up. Smoking in public places was prohibited. Oh yeah, smoking. We could they, people could smoke in the building. Reporters who smoke could oh, smoke in Carolyn's office. Oh, those were the days. You could they, in those days. I mean, you could come into my. All the reporters would come into the press secretary's office because you could smoke. See, I don't smoke, and that always seemed like cheating because the legislators who smoked would go outside and smoke with the reporters who smoked, and there was get a much better story. Yeah. It was a bonding. It was, there was a really. It was if a bonding. If you can thing. imagine the conference committee rooms upstairs. Back then, um, every single chair had an ashtray on it, and and there were so they were smoke-filled rooms. It was. Yep, they, it they really were, was smoke-filled rooms. Decisions were made in smoke-filled rooms. There were there were four of us in our uh, press room at the Star Bulletin at the time, and all four smoked. I don't think anyone does now, but but all at that time, everyone did. Hmm. No. We also yes. used typewriters. Is that true? <laughs> Nanette? Uh, 20 years ago, I worked in this building for one legislative session in the Republican Reference <clears throat> Bureau. So mm -hmm. okay. And um, I heard a lot of ghost stories about the ghosts haunting the building. What have you guys heard about that? I've heard a few about, uh, I've heard a, a woman who appears in a white moo. And I've heard of her um, doors that open and close at night. Uh, and I've heard, uh, well, there used to be a thing when people, I think there was some alcohol consumed and it was late at night and people had worked a lot and there would be uh, races with the rolly chairs, chariot races. And sometimes one would hear that the chairs moved without a human, but I don't know whether that was just tequila speaking or not. They were all lawmakers. I hate to bust your bubble. No ghosts. There was Just you lawmakers. Have those on the fifth floor? I there was I, there was there were stories there were stories about uh, the elevator to the governor's office opening and closing and you would suddenly smell a whiff of cigar smoke. This is at decades after Jack Burns had passed away. Um, but um, the, we we didn't really have that many really good ghost stories. There's a lot more stories about late night parties that <laughs> Carolyn will talk about later. Let's see. Let's go back to the slides then. Okay, that was a Colleen Hanabusa and Super Fairy. Uh, furlough Fridays. Oh, yeah. Well, what I wanted to go back to a little bit on how, how reporting has changed, how communications have, has mm. changed since the Capitol was opened. Mm -hmm. So when, when Richard started, I mean, print was king. You know, so the newspapers ruled the world. And it weren't, wasn't on stone tablets. And it, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tap, 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 tap. Um, so print ruled the world. When, when Robbie and I, then when uh, I came mm. in, or when, you know, later on, it was television. And 
and now it's social media. Mm -hmm. uh, on the on the television, and this is my personal experience, because social media, I'm also experiencing social media now with all of the new lawmakers, but on the TV end, I think um, when John Wehe came into office was, was when TV really became um, an important, a really started playing a huge role in how we covered um, politics. George Ariyoshi, when I was a reporter um, in TV, George, uh, Governor Ariyoshi was very reluctant. He, media was not his friend. He was very reluctant um, to go on camera or to be interviewed. He, the TV, me, he just did not like it. And I remember as a reporter, we used to, you know, sit around, you know, throwing back a couple and, you know, getting all, you know, that go governor doesn't want to talk to us, yada, 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 yada. After Governor Ariyoshi left office, and we were, um, he and Governor Waihe'e were called in to help mediate the hotel strike. And so we were camped out at the Ilikai when the mediation was going on. Was Governor Wai, um, Ariyoshi, Governor Waihe'e Ariyoshi had been out of office for about an hour, a year or a little bit more. And we were sitting around, you know, just talking because they're mediating and stuff and all the media's there so and TV cameras and everything and we're sitting there and Governor Ariyoshi is sitting there and he's talking and he's talking and he's and he's just a completely different man person mm -hmm. in w with the media and I remember thinking to myself governor if you had been if if we could have seen more of this uh, from you when you were governor, I think your coverage we would have been a lot more sympathetic, a lot more understanding, and I, it just struck me then how how from one governor to the next the, the type of communication, the medium made such a huge impact and, and difference. And so, in, in our administration, a lot of the stuff we did it was communicate. We communications was different. It was not just sitting around smoking with these guys and talking story. A lot of it was planned, uh, planning out our strategy, planning out our communications, planning out how we're gonna roll out his state of the state, how we're gonna roll out his legislation, how are we gonna put um, the positive, make it look positive. People like to call it spin. Um, well, your administration also did take things out on the road, like go to all the neighbor islands, capital for a day, and some is spin, but some gave people access. And then there were the, uh, instead of uh, Office of Information and Complaint, which the city had, it began state information, state information centers, uh, yeah. and those were helpful. So there were some things that, while there was cert certainly some spin going on, there was more of an uh, outreach, I think, that there was a, yeah. it has yo-yoed back and forth over the years. Some are mm -hmm. better than others about it. The, com yeah. the think, communication changed. Yeah. And, it's still and, ch and it's constantly changing. How we communicate is very in, different. In, uh, bringing it back to the, the Capitol building itself, if you go in the either the House or Senate chamber and you're standing at the podium and you look directly out at the back wall, there's a glass wall and an office behind that. That was built as the room where radio reporters would do play-by-play -play coverage of the session. He says, now Jack, uh, Governor Burns has just approached the stadium to the podium <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. That's what that, build, that office was for. Um, it was never used for that because there was only one radio station that ever went down to the Capitol and it quit a long time ago. Um, and the house workers got in there. Also, there are two press boxes on the floor of the House and Senate. One was supposed to be for the Star Bulletin, the other one was supposed to be for the Advertiser, and the Advertiser and the Bulletin would pick what other media would go in there with them on e either side. Now, there, in the House, there's only one uh, press box. The other one, because one paper never showed up, it got uh, absumed by um, the staff. House staff. And so now you can see how much the printed media, or media in itself, uh, mainstream media has shrunken at the Capitol that through disuse, all those wonderful spaces are now 
used for something else, even if it's storing mops. Uh. That's true. A lot of it did change in that regard. And uh, on the, uh, the other <coughs> hand, uh, Olelo started doing more gavel-to-gavel gavel -gavel coverage on public mm -hmm. access television, which has helped in a, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, immensely. But it, it definitely, uh, we've seen a lot in the building. I know um, the building, There's we uh, want to touch briefly on, there's been a move to make to lock down the building and take away some of this uh, public access. And while we all understand security concerns, we certainly hope that it doesn't go that route. I mean, even during the time when the uh, convention center was being debated and the international marketplace was a site and the merchants got very upset at the idea that they would be all ousted and <coughs> it was very tense when we were there, but was it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't go badly wrong. I think it was a near riot was what we... Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a tense, tense time. It was. was somebody saying something? Uh, so anyway, we should be wrapping. So if you had any final, I'm, I'm good on my final thoughts. I think it's a great building and has uh, great, uh, good public access and we should all use it in its various ways that we, we can, whether it's on the computer, via the television or coming down. And it's encouraging to me to have so many people coming to talk about uh, democracy and the building. It's a, it's a lovely building. The Civic Center is an important part of Honolulu. Uh, Hi Sam, the State uh, Museum is a gorgeous museum. Everyone should go over there at different times to see the, the uh, rotating exhibits. Thank you for listening to us. I have a lot more to say, but I'm still an employee of the legislature, so... <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, Representative Yamashita is my boss. Yeah. So um, the next time there's a symposium and I'm no longer an employee, invite me back and I'll have more stories to tell. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have our penultimate session now. You know, everything throughout the day has been kind of leading up to what's next, right? And a lot of um, what we've been talking about is how the design of public space engages with the users of that space. So I'm inviting our next panelists to come up. Um, Colin, Bill, and Luke, if you can come up. So we decided that this last session um, is really to talk about how do we do civics better? How as citizens, as um, members, uh, people who participate in a democracy, how can we be better at it? So what is the future of public engagement and how do our built environments help or hinder us in that endeavor? So, <laughs> they've spoken by phone, but they're um, coming together for the first time. So. Um, to my far right is Colin Moore, who is the director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Next to him is um, Bill Chapman, who is the interim dean of the School of Architecture, also at UH Manoa. And then Luke Evslin is the um, new county council member for the county of Kauai, just elected in November. Yes, Luke? Um, so we wanted to ask them to share their thoughts on public engagement and civic um, dialogue and especially in this age of great um, polarization and as our community is seeing deeper divides and um, deeper, harder ways to talk to each other in a civil way. So um, I believe they're going to each do opening remarks and then have a bit of a dialogue. So Bill, I believe you're going first. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And I want to, I think this has just been a terrific occasion and a terrific conference. So let's give it up for everybody who put this on. <laughs> it's really been well paced and really interesting. I thought the last group was a very hard act to follow. They all knew each other. And as Kirsten pointed out, we have met by phone for about 20 minutes yesterday. <laughs> And so we are old not friends. very we're old friends already. So we're not very well prepared. Um, I got a. Um, I was very sad to see that uh, one of our one of our own Burl Burling game passed away yesterday, and it was very sorry to see him go because he too promoted historic preservation in a very real real way through his columns and the bulletin. Am I getting re reverb? There's a little bit okay? of reverb. So. so getting more now. A white snake uh, concert now. <laughs> um, it was fun hearing 
things I've been involved with before. I remember when we were, uh, Nanette was talking about the Hawaii Capital Heritage Area program and Frank Haas and I, along with Mona Abida and Alice Guild were all part of that and it was sad that it didn't take off and it would have been wonderful if we could have had a, a uh, museum come out in the end as a result of that and I would still love to see that before. I put together a kind of show here this was actually a, a reduced version of a longer show that I did in Rome a couple of years ago. We were, it was a conference on public spaces and how do public spaces operate in society. And I thought this would be relevant. Kirsten tried to put me off from doing a slideshow, but this is, <laughs> I am what I am, and slides are what we know in my profession. So we are going to do a quick slideshow. So let's see if we can move this along. Okay, good, so this is Rome. And this was the occasion for it, and we were thinking about public spaces and how do they operate. I'm, you know, I teach at UH. I taught in American Studies for many years as well as running the preservation program. So I, you know, we tend to think in terms of theory and things. So I kind of brought a couple of theories with me. One was what we would call narrative theory: how do places tell a story? Another was kind of we all have to look to um, famous Marxists in the past so that we can give some clarity to what we're saying and Henri Lefebvre is one of the few people that actually wrote about cities and he talked about the social construction of spaces, spaces as metaphors for other aspects of life and then of course we always have to quote Michel Foucault who wrote about um, heterotopias which are kind of idealized spaces spaces that express what you want or something that gives a kind of parallel to the space you know. And I found that the Capital District really did that. So I'm going to be kind of getting away from just the building itself and thinking about the context. So here we have our own building and we have, I thought it was delightful hearing different ways of understanding. And I kind of began this talk thinking about how empty the place was, but in fact when we heard our last three panelists we realized how lively it is within. Um, I was talking to <laughs> someone, Max, just before this about the aesthetics of modernism. You know, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm going, I'm active with Daka Momo. I had a project with Tonya and Lewis and Don about modernism in Hawaii and, but part of me is always saying there's a, Max referred to this as a kind of drive-by aesthetic, right? And from the outside you see it as a kind of sculptural object in the landscape not as, say, a lively Roman forum, right? <clears throat> so this is a kind of Google image that kind of shows the buildings that kind of circumscribe and, and give definition to the area. And I'm going to try to move this quickly. And I'm going to suggest that there were different er times that people wanted to intervene. This was not one of our plans. This is for Washington, D.C., but this, this, this movement, the kind of City Beautiful movement had an impact in Hawaii too that nobody has quite mentioned yet, which was Charles Mulford Robinson came here in 1906 and gave the whole city a kind of neoclassical feel. You, you can see right there the palace would be kind of the center of a, a more formal arrangement. We had buildings from that time that really suggest kind of the colonial aspect of the district, though it was built upon, of course, a, a place that had been traditionally settled by Hawaiians and was a place of chiefly residence for a long time, Po'okaina, which was really, and I was sort of shocked when I heard how they had, when um, David was giving the presentation, how they dug this big hole and nothing was found. I can't imagine that would be true today if we were to dig a big hole in the middle of Honolulu. <laughs> so these kind of neoclassical buildings would populate the edges as a, in a way it kind of created the colonial space. And I loved hearing Ron Williams talk about Lahaina and loved to hear him move on to talk about Honolulu at another time. And Kalema's presentation was interesting on the way we understand how these places were later made into history as Katie showed too. Then we have the kind of Spanish colonial period but you can see this was really a kind of design period that was a reflection of American empire, as you know, the kind of the Americans' involvement in Puerto Rico and the Philippines. And then City Hall being another of the elements around the edge. The YMCA, the museum we just talked about, and of course, missing houses having a sort of place at it. And I 
kind of when I gave this paper, I kind of realized that you had these kind of nodes of memory and these kind of nodes of power circulating around the Capitol building. So you have churches that represented different sorts of eras in Hawaii's political structure. You have the, you know, the Hawaiian Protestant church at Kauai Hau, and then you have the kind of Queen Emma and Command of the Fourth Church um, at St. Andrews. And interestingly, we left a kind of remnant of our last queen um, at the edge, though we did lose Central Union Church after its conversion to a Studebaker sales <laughs> site. So here's Honolulu in 1938, and it's really quite a wonderful city with lots of greenery, and, and I didn't show you the downtown image of it, but it was a kind of perfect Mediterranean-looking city. And there were these different moments, and Don did a wonderful job taking us through these different plans through the years. But the post-war years were when you really started to get this new modernist vision of opening this space up and creating this kind of mythical space that we talked about. This kind of space, in a way, bereft of people as they took things out of the space and turned it more into a giant lawn with a sculpture in the middle, surrounded by pieces of government and culture that we somehow value. So here's the master plan of 1967, which is very interesting. And you'll notice that the archive was at one point removed. We'll see that in another picture in a moment. Here's the, the model. You see the archive building for a little while was going to be demolished or moved to another place, of course. And here's the capital we know today. And that, like I said, is just a piece of it. It's just a piece around the edge of it. And I always refer to this as the undome. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we are the only undome in the world, I think. Um, the Iolani Palace is a kind of remnant, and it su suggests some of the kind of conflict that's still kind of inherent in our governance, if you think. And the uh, Iolani Palace is a, as is the fort, and the Iolani Palace remains a place of protest and focus in many ways. So these are some of the other buildings around the edge. And you can see Frank Fozzi wanted to make sure that he was still looking out over the Capitol area and managed to build a building that was taller than anything that was allowed other than by government buildings. And uh, the federal buildings, again, another node and a little away from it now. And here's the slide I thought I was turning to. It's interesting that, you know, I, I think Ron's talk gave attention to this, that we have a in 1965, we saw the palace as a piece of history, as a museum. And now with the revival of Hawaiian activism and uh, thinking of uh, different ways of thinking about Hawaii, we realize now that the palace, maybe that's why it becomes a kind of lightning rod for focus, because it's not entirely a, a museum site. It's also a, a symbol of a, of, of a kind of conflicting idea of governance. And so I think that's why it ends up being a site of protest quite often. So, but otherwise, so much of the capital is a kind of open site, but I've been reminded by the talks we've had this morning how, how lively, in fact, the plaza area does become at times, and how lively it is all within the building, though you don't really see that from the outside of things. So those are my remarks, and so I hope that kind of gives a setting for the two of you to take over on this. <laughs> sure, thanks, Bill. <laughs> Um, so, so one of the, the very best parts of my job is I get to, oh, do, are we switching? We, we got to switch. We, we got to switch PowerPoints. I'm sorry. So you could use mine I could, if you like. I could, yeah, that would be a, a very poor architectural uh, lecture, I'm sure. Yeah. So one of the very best parts of my job is that I have the privilege of teaching the big U.S. politics class at UH Manoa, which means that a huge number of students get to learn about American politics from me, which you know maybe maybe bad for them, but is a lot of fun for me to uh, to hear what students, 18, 19, uh, 20, 21 year olds, are thinking about American politics today. And a couple of years ago, I had 
for me what was a, a very disturbing moment, which was a, a very good student, an articulate student, um, after I gave my usual lecture about how much I love the state capitol, that it embodies these principles of democracy that we've talked about, that it encourages uncomfortable encounters sometimes with citizens and state legislators, that it's designed to, to welcome, not to intimidate, like a lot of the neoclassical capitals on the mainland. Um, the student raised his hand and he asked me, wait a minute, you mean Hawaii has its own legislature? And I, thought for, and, and I thought for a second, what do you mean? What do you think happened in that building? And he said, well, I don't know. I thought you know, there were people from DC who came down or something like that. <laughs> and so this is generally a, 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 a cheery conversation this afternoon. And I, and I want to keep it that way. But I do want to remind us of some, some uncomfortable uh, truths. So you've probably seen this graph before about public trust in government. This is probably not new to, to folks in this audience. Um, it, it's quite low. It's, it's um, basically at historically low levels. Um, civil society, this is another way to measure the health of our democracy, um, not just through voting. We get a little obsessed about voter turnout, and of course there's many ways for people to participate. Uh, this is just a measure of church attendance, union measurement, um, the sort of organizations that we think facilitate democracy because there are opportunities for citizens to encounter different people, um, to engage in organizations that connect them with government, um, and those of course have, have made remarkable declines even since the year 2000. Um, and I want to give you a sense of, of what it looks like here. So I'll just show you two slides from the results of two different surveys my public policy center took um, in August of 2017 and August of 2018 about the health of our local democracy. Um, and and I'm, I'm sad to say that, that it's not good. Um, we asked this one question, which is a standard question in political science when you're trying to gauge um, health of democracy questions, citizen trust, and, and it just is simply, do, do you think it's the government is run for a few big interests, or do you think it's run for the benefit of the people themselves? And if folks don't think it's being run for the benefit of people themselves, then, uh, then democracy doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, and you can see that the results here, and this is uh, a survey of Oahu and the neighbor islands, uh, are not good. Um, when you see that, particularly on Oahu, uh, nearly 50% of respondents were willing to say that it's mainly run for the benefit of big interests. Another way to look at this, um, we want to know how, how much people were involved. Now we know our, our, our voter participation, our voter turnout rates are, are pretty bad and, and we spend a lot of time um, in the media complaining about that, but there's a lot of ways folks can participate. Um, but also, it doesn't look like they're participating very much in these other ways, community meetings, projects, uh, attending public meetings. Uh, you know, 42% of people said they, they never have. Um, and then it goes down, down in predictable ways until you get to the folks who are attending things 10 or more times. And I think we all know, know a lot of those people. I think a lot of those people are in this room. Um, and that's terrific, right? But I don't think anyone who goes to a lot of public meetings like me, um, you know, we often have this experience where we see the exact same people there all of the time kind of raising the same issues. And so I think the question for civic engagement is, is how do we get a broader set of voices? How do we get younger voices? Um, how do we get folks from more disadvantaged communities? Because all of those are important inputs for the government to have for, for what this building is designed to facilitate, which is to be a welcome and opening, op uh, open space um, for everyone. So, so what can be done? I'm going to give you three modest suggestions. Um, I don't have full answers to these questions. Nobody does. Um, and it's very complicated. But, but I'll, I'll give you some three things I think we can do. And the first is that we need more civic education. We need more civic education. This democracy, both locally and nationally, is in a crisis. And one thing we can do, in a crisis for a number of reasons uh, that, that uh, you can all articulate, but one improvement we can make is more civic education. So this graph, all this does is show you the results of this uh, big test um, um, for eighth graders about their standard civics prof proficiency in the eighth grade. And you can see that, you know, it's just a little above 20 percent um, meet the standards for civic proficiency um, because we have not invested in civics education in the way that there really were significant investments in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s. And it also works. There is a lot of evidence to suggest 
um, that, that if you do it, um, you, you really can improve these outcomes. So here in Hawaii, we don't have enough. We have one semester, and there's no assessment. There's no required test uh, for, for students to demonstrate their knowledge. Um, there's a lot of empirical evidence that when you do require more civics education, the best thing it does is it closes the gap between more disadvantaged students for immigrants who don't grow up in families that have deep familiarity with state and local politics, and that empowers them. That's something we can improve by offering more and better civics education, and actually, to their credit, the Department of Education and the new social studies standards that were just released recently have done a good job in trying to address some of this um, by, by making the participation in democracy class, which is our required semester of civics education, more action-oriented. Um, so they, they deserve a lot of credit for that, but we need more. Um, the second thing I'd suggest is that, that our online spaces need to be as welcoming as our physical ones are, as this building is. Um, and I do think our state capitol website is, is pretty good. Um, it's really good for elected officials, for um, lobbyists, for nonprofit leaders, for experts. I'm not sure how much it succeeds for average citizens who are approaching this for the first time, who are told that there's a bill in the ledge and maybe they should take a look at it. If you try to do that, um, you go from this very friendly looking page to something that looks much more unfriendly and intimidating. Now, I can read what this says. I think a lot of you in this room can read wh what this says. But imagine if, you know, what, what is this? It looks like, you know, sort of reminds me of when I rode the New York subway for the first time. And it was like Brooklyn bound XXQR except at night train express. And, you know, it's completely impossible uh, to understand. And it's very unwelcoming. There are better ways to do this because most people are interacting with the legislature online. They don't have the resources or the time to come to this gorgeous building. Um, you know, and, and here's a, just a simple example of a state that's done it better. I think Massachusetts has a much more accessible page. Um, it, it actually won an award recently. And, and one of the reasons I think it does succeed is because of things like this. You know, they, 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 this, the page is designed to help the citizens who are the least able to access this information. All the stuff that, that, that lobbyists and advocates want to access is behind the scenes, but you know, most popular bills, that's the sort of thing that people want to see when they're, when they're approaching this for the first time. And then the last thing I'll say is we need more deliberative civic engagement. Um, we need to think more creatively about how legislators, how, how, how um, other, other state officials can uh, directly engage with the public that goes beyond just this, you know, stand and, 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 uh, and use the microphone, um, you know, because that really is just one-way communication. It improves the legitimacy, um, it improves the, the justice of our policies, because by engaging a wider audience, uh, you get this diverse voice, and it improves policy effectiveness, because there's a lot of local knowledge. Um, and citizens can really, I think, help craft better public policy when they're directly involved. Now, this is, an, this is often expensive. It's more difficult than our traditional system of testimony. Um, but there are ways to do this. There are things like citizen juries, uh, which uh, the Public Policy Center at UH experimented with inviting one member of every neighborhood board to hear from experts, to talk deeply about what, in this experiment, um, a, a new constitutional convention would mean, to think deeply about these issues. Uh, with experts and then write their own report. This kind of active engagement, inviting citizens rather than requiring them um, to come to the Capitol to say a few words um, and th that may or may not be listened to. It, this is more of a collaborative project. So, so those are my, my three suggestions um, and I think we can um, you know, model our, our online civic engagement, our education, um, and, our, and our current deliberative public policy or, or participatory activities after the model of, of this building, what it really represents. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm honored to be here today. I'm, I feel a little bit uh, like I'm maybe not the best person to be speaking about civic engagement at the state capitol, as I told these guys yesterday. Uh, this is only my third time ever here. I've lived in Hawaii my entire life. My first time at the state capitol was about a year ago, and I was actually uh, nearby outside Iolani Palace, and I had to uh, find a bathroom, and I saw this. Uh, <laughs> this big public building over here, and I thought, oh, there must be an easily accessible public bathroom over there, and, uh, and, and, and little did I know. Um, so, so maybe my one concrete suggestion here, if there's any 
architects here that are going to design the next great public building. Uh, if you could put a public restroom on the first floor, that'd be that'd be great. Um, you know, but I um, so I've been an elected official for four months, and the way that I think about civic engagement has changed uh, pretty drastically over that time. You know, especially I think um, from the day that I got my first paycheck from the county of Kauai really changed my perspective. You know, and I've always um, thought and spoke about civic engagement as if there's there's two sides, right? There's the community and there's the public officials, and both sides have to really do their part. Uh, I think we've all been to community meetings where, where angry community members, you know, disrupt the meeting or, or, or end the meeting. You know, and this happens on Kauai all the time. I'm not sure about here. But, um, uh, or we've been to meetings where, you know, public officials uh, are, you know, it's clear that they've already made their decision or they're withdrawn or, or they don't even hold the meeting to begin with, right? And I've always said, hey, both sides really have to do their part. And both sides are sort of mutually negatively reinforcing, right? A withdrawn public official makes angry community members, angry community members make the public officials get more withdrawn. And we get this sort of spiral as shown in Collins' graph. Um, and so I've always thought, hey, the solution, both sides got to do their part. You know, and then I got paid by the county of Kauai, and I realized I, I, I'm wrong there. Um, I, I get paid pretty well as a public official. Most public officials get paid pretty well for a job that has uh, no, you know, um, requirements, no, no time requirements, no, no skills necessary. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I get a $300 a month gas stipend. I get $150 a month cell phone stipend. You know, so if you go to a community meeting, you're taking time off work or you're taking time away from your family, um, and certainly nobody's paying you to drive home afterwards. If I go to a community meeting, I'm, I'm paid to go there, you know, for the most part, uh, and, and I'm paid by the people who are in that room, right? So, so the burden is on me as the, as the uh, government official now to engage with the community. The burden is not on the community to engage with government. So, in, so in, for me, um, you know, I just want to avoid sort of this, this, this false parity here between the community and the government officials. It's the government officials that need to do a better job of, of uh, engaging the community. And I think it's the burden is on me and my fellow elected officials to, to get those numbers, you know, that call and showed going back up there. And it's just engaging at every level, no matter what. And if, if <laughs> um, thank you for that applause. Uh, if, if the community's mad at me, that's my fault for not engaging them early enough in the process, you know, and if they stay mad at me all along, you know, that's, that's part of the job, I can't withdraw. Um, you know, and next I just want to a little bit expand on the idea of civic engagement. And I, I love public policy, I think about it all day long. I go to bed thinking about property tax reform and I wake up thinking about, you know, how do we build more ADUs on Kauai. Um, <laughs> But, but I don't expect everybody else to love pu public policy, and I don't th think everybody else should love public policy, right? And I think, like, if you're a great soccer player or canoe paddler, the best thing you can do to engage with your community maybe is to coach high school soccer or coach high school canoe paddling, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be research this bill and, and submit testimony. Um, or if you live in a, in a community and you have a park down the street, you know, potentially the best thing, best form of civic engagement is to go paint that park bench. Um, you know, and, and of course, if you're passionate about politics, definitely engage. I'm not trying to dissuade anybody, but I don't. I, I think we often like guilt people to engage with politics, and I just don't think that's always the highest or best form of, of civic engagement. Um, maybe most importantly, if there's any young architects in this room, you know, go out there and design some some kick-ass building facing the street that encourages pedestrian, you know, uh, connectivity and as a center, a, a hub for the community. Right? That that could be the highest form of, of community engagement or civic engagement. Um, I don't know, has anybody read the book um, Our Towns by James Fallows? Nobody in the room. Oh my gosh, it's such a great book. Um, and uh, I, I, oh, did somebody raise their hand? Yes. Oh. Um, so in the book, he, James Fallows is a um, contributor to, or is, I think, a contributor to the Atlantic still. And uh, he, uh, he flew around to all these like thriving downtown areas around the country and lived in all these areas. And he writes about, uh, you know, the ways that they're similar and different. And, and at the end of the book, he kind of compiles a list of, of um, some broad similarities between these places. And of course, like walkability and, and you know, mixed use, you know, are, are some markers of a thriving downtown. But one thing that he mentioned is that nobody in these places talks about national politics, which was just really interesting to me. And, I, you know, I'm not entirely sure what the, the concrete takeaway from that is, but I think there's just so many, so many great ways we can get involved that don't involve politics. Um, and just lastly, I want to talk a little bit about, um, if we're talking about the future of civic engagement, I got to talk about Facebook um, and social media. I got on Facebook in 2004. I was a freshman in college. 
Um, it was the first year that I think it was available to college students, so I imagine I've been on it longer than maybe anybody in here, um, and I probably spend, unfortunately, more time on it than anybody in here. Um, and I, um, you know, like any good marriage, I have a good love-hate relationship with the platform. I, I remember in 2015, I, they sent out a survey saying, uh, you know, is, is Facebook been a force for good in the world? <laughs> And in 2015, I said, yes, for sure. You know, I, I get to watch pictures of my, uh, my nieces and nephews growing up, and it helped get Barack Obama elected president. It's been a, it's been a great, you know, source of good in the world. And then in uh, uh, 2017, they sent out the same survey, you know, and I gave it up. I think it was a zero out of 10. No, it's been a terrible thing for the world, right? It's ripping us all apart. You know, and I think now if I were to answer the thing, I'd give it a more nuanced answer. And, and certainly Facebook has its flaws in the way it's developed, right? It, it helps highlight you know, or helps promote, I think, outrage over discourse. You know, but just like this building has its flaws, I don't think we can blame the building on dysfunction in Hawaii politics. I think it, you know, it, it's on us uh, to figure out how to use these platforms. And for me, as a as a public official, I'm I'm definitely changing the way that I engage here, and just recognizing that I can't change anybody's opinion online. You know, especially on a, on a partisan subject. Uh, the way to have these discussions, I think, is 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 one on one because I think we're really talking to each other for one on one. When we're online, we're not talking to the other person; we're talking for an audience, right? And that just brings down the level of discourse. But as a public official, I really can engage really well in other ways, right? I can walk out of a council meeting, on you know, and and write 400 word summary on that meeting and post it to 4,000 people, you know, who never would have gone and read the minutes from that meeting, right? And 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 get information out about that meeting, or I can go on and say, hey, you know. Kauai friends, um, you know, do you guys have any good ideas for public policy? And get just a ton of great ideas, or even better, you know, hey, Kauai friends, have you guys ever uh, applied for a building permit, and what were the barriers here, and, and maybe how can I help, right? And, and again, you just get hundreds of, of great comments, and we can engage really productively like that without really driving a wedge between us. So um, to tie all that together, I don't really know how to tie it together. Maybe we can tie it together as we discuss here uh, more. <laughs> but uh, but uh, and anyway, thank you guys. <laughs>
explained why it was so damaging for democracy that people weren't joining bowling leagues anymore, um, which, which sounds unexpected, right? But it turns out that these non-political interactions do things like build trust. You know, places where people have a lot of these non-political interactions are also places where their democracies function better because they know people from different walks of life. It's harder to categorize them, you know, as, you know, what do they say on the, the, the social media, like libtards or sort of, you know, uh, you know, a Trumpist activists. I mean, it's harder to dismiss and demonize people when you know them individually as as uh, as citizens. And so that's why I don't think I don't think social media can. Um, I mean, it, it can be helpful, but I don't think it substitutes for that actual human interaction. And actually, that's one thing we can succeed here. I mean, because Hawaii is still a relatively small place where people know each other and are relatively and are still kind and polite. Um, I think that is a huge advantage that, that we have um, and that we, um, you know, I, I think should remember and, and treasure, and that's something this, this building helps. Um, I mean, you know, social media also allows us to do some powerful things like to communicate and get feedback from folks. Um, you know, but again, that's just a kind of smaller slice of the population, which is why, you know, if you want to really build a deliberative democracy, it sometimes means searching out people, those voices that you don't often hear, and inviting them into these discussions in an affirmative way, not just waiting for them to take the initiative to contact you. Yeah, I, I mostly agree. I'm, I'm getting my master's right now in um, public administration online, and it's, it's my first sort of online experience here, and uh, first <laughs> online schooling experience. And, it's, and there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's online forums are a big part. This is how we have a dialogue in class. And it's, it's been interesting to me to see the level of dialogue we have in these online forums, which are structured pretty similar to social media compared to the discourse that I have on my Facebook. You know, and I think it, it's, it's so much more respectful. We can have very divergent opinions and sort of, I think, get somewhere at the end of this conversation, which uh, you, you, you never get anywhere in, a, in an argument on Facebook. And, and I think part of the reason is maybe twofold, and I'm still struggling with trying to figure out why, but I think one is, is um, sort of forced uh, diversity in a way, right? Facebook, it's so easy to retreat into our own silos or our own communities. And we know that we're talking and we've got our 10 other people reading that that are similar minded in us that are going to click like on that as soon as I say something that reinforces those silos. Whereas if I'm talking in my class, right, I'm just talking to that one person. Um, that person, for the most part, comes from a very different background than I have. Um, and it just changes the level of, of dialogue. And just, you know, to expand on that, the, the idea of talking to one person is so uh, is so different than our normal social media experience, right? Uh, 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 you especially see it on Twitter, you know, when people are, um, I think so often, I don't know how many people are on Twitter here now, but, but you used to see a lot of people like quoting a tweet and then responding to that tweet, uh, which at least would give you the ability to sort of see the context that that other tweet was made in. Now so often you see people just like taking a screenshot of a tweet and then responding to that tweet and then there's no, possibility of seeing the actual context that that tweet is in, right? So they're sort of removing the context to make their own point, um, which, which just benefits nobody at all. And it's just made to, to you know, reinforce our own, our own community. So I, um, how, how do we end up figuring these, this out? I um, have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> More parking spaces. <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 I will add a little bit. I, um, uh, as I sort of said in my, in my initial talk, I think I, you know, it's taken me 15 years to figure this out, but I'm finally figuring out how to use social media, right? I can use it to engage in one way. I should not be using it to engage in another way. And it's, it's forced me to actually have some in-person conversations with friends. You know, and I've had friends that I've known forever. And then I become friends on Facebook, and I'm like, oh my god, why did I, you know, friend you on Facebook? I didn't want to know all that about your <laughs> political beliefs, um, you know. And um, and but but it's taken that, and then we have a conversation in person, you know, and we kind of get somewhere with it. So and I feel like maybe it took me 15 years. I really think, or I hope that the um, next generation of users or high school kids sort of are already having that intuitively, right? You don't really see younger people engaging too much in these superheated, you know, rhetorical, political conversations. So I think they're sort of getting it while we're all still adjusting. I think it's been kind of fun meeting two people I didn't know before, and we talked by phone, 
a little bit by email before, but and maybe it is a kind of lesson about what the difference is about meeting people one on one than yeah. from just meeting them at an electronic distances, Cause, right? Because we all yelled at each other by email before yeah, we were yeah. meeting. <laughs> so I, had, I just I just had a different mental picture of both of them. That's all. But they're still nice fellows on the phone too. But um, I'd like to ask a question. This goes to um, Colin. Your discussion about civic education and how that is um, <clears throat> sort of a fundamental that's being neglected. So, you know, often when people are talking about something controversial or, or they're worried about, they'll say, you know, as a taxpayer, I believe X, Y, and Z. Do you think there's a difference when people um, talk about themselves as a taxpayer versus talking about themselves as a citizen? That's a, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, how, how people frame their, their views. Uh, I mean, the... Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine if you're going to frame yourself as a taxpayer, you're, you're about to complain about something that the government has spent money on. Um, and, uh, but, but hmm. um, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how much civic education necessarily would, 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 would help that particularly, because I mean, I can imagine framing myself as a taxpayer too to, to complain about something, but um, I do, I do think that it, um, it, it, it provides a better way to think about all of the trade-offs that are going into making public policy when you understand how, how difficult it can be and, um, you know, and, and gives you more trust, actually, in the way the government does spend money. We do, we do have some evidence that that's true, that the more you know about what tax dollars actually go to support, uh, the more you do increase your level of trust and, uh, in the government. I mean, people have, as you probably know, wildly incorrect ideas about what the government actually spends its money on. Um, one of my favorite uh, statistics or, or studies is you asked folks, you know, would you like to spend you know, more money or less money on Medicare, defense, social security, and foreign aid, right? And pretty much most Americans will say, yeah, I'd like more money spent on Medicare. Yeah, I'd like more money spent on Social Security. Um, maybe not more money in defense. We can keep it equal. And I'd like way less money spent on foreign aid. And then you ask, would you like, uh, would you like your taxes to go up, stay the same, or go down? And everyone says, well, you know, I'd, I'd like my taxes to go down, thanks. Let's spend more money on Social Security. And I'd like a tax decrease. Uh, and you can see how Democrats and Republicans can both frame that to their uh, disadvantage, and my favorite, or to their advantage, rather. And then my favorite part of that whole study is uh, you, uh, you, they get to the foreign aid question. You ask, okay, so, so how much money do you think the federal, U.S. federal government spends on foreign aid? And uh, the response is, uh, the, the, the median response is 25%. And then you ask them, how much would you like the U.S. federal government to spend on foreign aid? And Americans say, well, I think 10% sounds reasonable. The reality is the U.S. federal government spends less than 1% on foreign aid. If we spent 25% on foreign aid, uh, people in Haiti would be living in palaces. Um, <laughs> And so I think that's what, yeah. And, all love us and yeah, but I think that's one thing civic education does get at is you know understanding the trade-offs that policymakers have to make, um, and that 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 is that is essential. I get to ask all the fun questions here. You can go through your list. Here, so be yeah. Well, Bill has my list, and I do not. Oh, yeah, so I have it. I'll share it with you. Well, you know, one thing about um, the difference between a, you know. between a democracy, which is um, all people coming together make decisions collectively, versus a republic, which is electing officials to get together and make those decisions on our behalf. And you know, we kind of debate which which is better because we all think that we should have something to say about the decisions. What do you see as the role of the individual influencing public policy versus the role of the expert, you know, someone who actually studies homelessness or transportation engineering or education policy or historic preservation or whatever that issue may be? And that's a general question, so we'll go with our elected officials yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, that sounds, that sounds your turn anyway. <laughs> I've only been at this for four months, so I don't really have <laughs> um, You know, for me, I think just... Uh, uh, both perspectives are important. I expect the expert to help come up with some of the solutions. I expect the average citizen to just tell me what the problems that they're facing are, right? I think um, I always tell people if they're coming to testify at county council, I was like, don't 
spend a ton of time researching the subject. You don't got to give us the answer. Just just tell us, you know, about the potholes that you drive through on your way to work. That's what we need to know, you know, and then it's up to us to try and figure out this solution. So that's all I kind of um, uh, way to do. I'm always, I'm actually kind of fearful that tapping into the sort of the, the deep consciousness of societies can be kind of a dangerous thing too. I mean, <laughs> Trumpism is built on a, on a kind of lack of faith and expertise, and he's managed to kind of corral that resentment, right? You know more about this than me, you teach this stuff. You're right, it is, there is a demonization of experts, but I think well, my favorite description of how this should work was, uh, was given a long time ago by the famous American pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, who said, who compared it to, to fixing a shoe. He said only the, the man wearing the shoe can tell you, you know, can tell you where it hurts, but only the expert shoemaker can actually can fix the shoe. Um, and so you do need experts to explain how you can address these public policy problems um, because, you know, no one expects average citizens to have some deep familiarity with, you know, how we can change tax policy to increase affordable housing. Um, but it does, I, I think it does get back to this idea that we need a diversity of voices. Um, and I think for, on social media and in public in forums um, and at the legislature, we hear from a, a relatively small number of, of folks. And so we don't know about all these other people and, you know, where, where their shoe hurts. And, and we have maybe the experts who can help solve their problems too. Yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm a believer. Oh, no, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that at all. No, I, obviously. I'm just suggesting that, yeah. the, that maybe the average person, their default is to go to simple answers for questions similar to yours about the, talking about foreign aid, right? The kind of, whether it's foreign aid, whether it's hordes, well, hordes attacking us from Mexico, or whether it's whether it's welfare mothers. I mean, these are the kind of truisms that get passed on in social media and things like that. And, and, and this can be the problem with social media. I mean, these more organic opportunities to interact, um, people are better at making these trade-offs and understanding these trade-offs. People, people aren't stupid. They know that if they want more government spending, there might have to be a revenue increase. But the trade-offs politically, uh, for strategic reasons, are rarely framed that way. Um, and it's, it's, you need to create situations where people can understand those trade-offs better um, and, and help legislators decide, okay, well, I'm willing to, you know, I'll pay a little more in taxes to get a little more in this. But that's, that's how it should be framed rather than, you know, these people are trying to steal your social security or, you know, these fools in D.C. or Honolulu are trying to raise your taxes and you don't hear the other side of it at all. I guess related to that is the role of um, large community and public gatherings, so protests, rallies, um, marches, and we've seen a lot of that uh, focused on the Capitol in particular. I think yesterday when we were doing our 50th anniversary of the, the Capitol and there's that, that happening in the background, there was a student protest on climate change and, you know, what is the future of that, that, that we are now leaving for the next generation. And when you see these um, kind of marches or protests or gathering, what role does that have in policy making, and how does that relate to some of the kind of deeper dive issues? I actually think the building addressed that quite well. I think the plaza was really designed in order to accommodate that. And we've heard from a number of people talking today how they can hear the protests from within, and, and I wonder to what degree they talked about it ahead of time, but they managed to come up with something that is well designed for that, I think, but. Mm, again, I don't really have direct experience with this building at all. Uh, yesterday happened to be the very first protest that I could hear from my office at the historic county building on Kauai. And I walked outside and there was, you know, 50 kids on the street talking about climate change, you know, and um, which, for me, it was a, was a really powerful experience to see, see them all out there. Um, you know, and there's not a whole lot of protests in front of that building. And um, uh, unfortunately, I was the only person at work that day. So, uh, so <laughs> none, none of my fellow colleagues saw it. So, you know, and, uh, uh, but, but again, like, um, at least on an island like Kauai, you know, it's not so much the power of, of the protest at that moment for the cars that are driving by or the politicians that happen to be nearby, right? It's the power of... Um, social media to amplify that protest. And I think from that perspective, they, they did succeed at really uh, gaining some traction. 
And, and if I could just add one thing to what, what Luke said, the, the power is also in, in the training, in the experience, especially for young people. I mean, that, that experience of participating in politics, um, and often people do that first because they're really angry at something. They're really angry that their, you know, their pothole isn't being filled, or they're really angry the government isn't addressing climate change. Um, and they get involved in one of these movements, and they learn the skills that, that don't leave you. I mean, they, they are skills that stay with you for the rest of your life, and you can pinpoint this um, empirically for a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of studies that show these, these are the moments um, that can recruit whole generations of people um, to, to participate um, in civic action. And we know this, I mean, the, the famous example of this, of course, are the protests surrounding the Vietnam War. That's why there's a whole generation of lawmakers and public officials, you know, that are overrepresented, people who got their start. Um, as, as Vietnam War protesters. I mean, people like, for example, Governor Neil Abercrombie, who starts off as an anti-war uh, protester and, and then uh, that leads his way into politics. So, you know, they, there's a lot of benefits to that that go way beyond just the initial action. Yeah, interesting point. You know, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, but it does relate to protesting. And um, there's been kind of, this has been touched on throughout the day, but the balance between transparency and openness and security and safety. And where do you draw that line? Um, this building was, of course, designed to be open and um, to foster those organic connections that, that aren't necessarily scripted or curated. And yet we live in a time when um, that may be dangerous. And there are, there are current bills before this legislature to discuss enclosing corridors, to put up barriers, to remove parking from under the building, to add magnetometers, to basically not make it such an open and welcoming place. What is that balance between security and welcoming, between safety and transparency, and what are some of the things that should go into that discussion? No, I think that's, that's really interesting. I don't know, I, a lot of you probably remember the old federal building. It always looked imposing, but it was surprisingly easy to access. I remember when you had to get your passport there. Now it's really like entering a fortress. It's, you very rarely get to have a meeting in the federal building because of their concern with security. I did notice someone look askance at me when I brought a briefcase in today, so I don't know if that was actually someone, <laughs> a security person or not. But I think we do live in a different kind of world now, and it's probably going to affect our public places. And I keep hoping that maybe, you know, advanced technology, sort of like what's happening with airports, will kind of make it unnecessary to really have the kind of frisk and search kind of approach to things, you know? Um, you know, for me, it's interesting coming here, so I did come here for the inauguration a few months ago and did wander those hallways up there and, and see how open it was, at least on that day, as everybody's handing out free food. <laughs> um, but um, uh, it was very different than to go back to our, you know, historic county building on Kauai, where, where, where my office is, and I love that building. It's this really old building built in 1912, but, uh, but you do need a magnetic card to get to my office, you know, and I was like, you know, and, and none of the county council members are ever even in their offices, but, uh, but compared to here, and it's, it's a big, shame and because it means the public's not using that building almost at all I, I we rarely get anybody dropping by you know and as we see sort of the decline in our community spaces in general right we're just losing these these chances for connectivity and when we put up that magnetic door that's one less chance for connecting with the community so um so you know for the most part i'm going to always err on the side of of increased access I agree with Luke. I mean, I'm, I'm hardly a security expert. People have to be safe, um, but I think there should be as little of that as possible. Or... Um, we will take qu audience questions. All right, middle. Right. Thank you uh, very much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. This is a subject that uh, continues, I think, we all can see the discourse separation and uh, uh, lack of uh, civic engagement continues to decline. And uh, social media is, is, a, is a cause. A lack of civic uh, education is a cause. I think another cause is uh, the separation of uh, news media. People who watch CNN only versus people who watch Fox only. They don't watch the other one. They don't talk to each other. And, and, uh, 
continues that down that down slide. So when you need confirmation bias by yeah. getting your news from one source. What are your thoughts on <coughs> how we can reverse this trend? I'm going to try to repeat that in a very short way, but basically I think we're looking for what are some advice, guidelines, best practices for increasing both um, knowledge and skill when we're talking about consuming media as well as engaging in, in civics, um, more or less. Uh, okay, I can take the first crack at this. This is really you know, the million dollar question in, in American democracy, but I'll add one more uh, one more thing to be concerned about, actually. We, there's been a lot of focus on the folks who watch MSNBC and the folks who watch Fox News and they never talk to each other. But with all of those opportunities to find the news source that, that uh, best accords to your political view, what the majority of people have done is they don't watch any news. Um, it's not the case that you know today at 6 o'clock, um, you know, there's a little local news, but you can always switch to that and watch Hulu or Netflix or whatever. So the most dangerous thing in my mind actually is not the polarization of the news, it's, a, it's the fact that a lot of people don't watch any news. Um, and the people who do consume news in, consume it intensely. The people who watch Fox News, people who watch MSNBC watch a whole lot of news and maybe it's bias, but because there's so many options, a lot of people don't watch any news. Um, which makes them all the more susceptible to conspiracy theories, um, the sort of bizarre uh, stories about you know American democracy being controlled by some you know dark cabal operating out of a pizza parlor or something you know that that really do sometimes lead to violent incidents. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that I think one of the biggest challenges is we have to figure out a way to fund our media um, in a way that that um, continues to allow for the sort of um, in-depth uh, investigative reporting and, 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 um, and broad-minded coverage that we expect from the national newspapers. And actually, the Washington Post, the New York Times, some of these big news outlets have been doing all right recently. What has really almost disappeared are local newspapers. Um, you know, the, I mean, I just, I was thinking about this when Richard was, uh, um, was talking about, you know, working the old Capitol beat and all the reporters who were down here. I mean, I think you could fit the number of real investigative reporters in this state into sort of, you know, a big bedroom or something. Um, I mean, there's, there's really very few, and that's true not just here, that's true in all communities. Um, I don't know if the model is what, what we seem to be going to, which is sort of a philanthropic model. I mean, Civil Beat follows that model, the Washington Post follows that model. Um, it, it, maybe that isn't desirable, but it's better than nothing. But I think your question is, is essentially, uh, you know, is the most important question facing American democracy. And I, I don't know if we have a really good answer to it yet. Um, yeah, I'm not going to come up with a great answer. But I, I, I saw some survey recently saying I think it was either 60s, 70s, or 80s, but, but um, that you know, the number of people who said, would you be okay with, or would you not be okay with your son or daughter marrying somebody of a opposing political ideology? And it's something like 9% back then said, no, they wouldn't be okay with it. And now it's something like 90%, right? And so, and, and, and it was a pretty quick transition. And I think even in the last five years, it's, it's taken another pretty big tick upwards, right? And part of that is, um, is also that we are, you know, we live in more politically segregated communities um, and um, and I think part of it you know is the decline in um, in in uh, you know uh, in sort of third spaces places that we can all sort of meet and interact right we're all joining different community groups of uh, maybe a similar political ideology for me the most valuable thing that I do in my entire life is a uh, is paddling out rear canoe right you get stuck in a canoe with five other people you know and, and Two of those you might um, strongly disagree with, and you got to paddle with him, and you and you spend a lot of time with him, and you realize, hey, this guy's not such a bad guy, and I think you can talk your way through a lot of things. So, how do we create our communities where we're getting more of this engagement? You know, um, some of it's um, you know urban planning, um, and um, yeah. Anyway, I don't have a good answer. I think there are, I think there are a lot of civic kinds of organizations and and sort of popular organizations where you would run into people of different political ilk. 
I don't know if there's any members of the Adventurers Club of Honolulu out there, <laughs> but that's a good example. You're often eating with people who um, have quite different political views. Going to a gym, you'll run into people who think quite differently. So I think space seems to be a really important way to break through this as opposed, I mean, real places as yeah. opposed to electronic spaces, yeah? Interesting. <clears throat> Let's see. Right here. Uh, I'm an architect, and I guess I came here to listen to people talk about maybe some architectural solutions for getting into the future. Um, one of the things I've been very interested in over the past few years is uh, disruptive technology. And uh, I guess everybody knows a little bit about disruptive technology. But the simple story is a uh, guy shows a picture of 1901. It's Wall Street. There's all these horse-drawn vehicles and one car. 2000, I mean, 1917, the new picture is all, horse uh, all cars in one horse-drawn vehicle. He says, this is disruptive technology. It's coming towards you, and you, don't, you want to oppose it, but you can't. It's just going to overwhelm you. Uh, if you remember mobile phones, the first mobile phones were those things called bricks, and everybody in the house moved an area along. And uh, so everybody in the audience says, yes, they remember bricks. So the story goes that um, a stockbroker is there talking to the Arab sheik, and he goes, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to crash Gulf and sort of, you know, buy Texaco or whatever? And phone call goes through to the New York Stock Exchange. Nobody's got a camera, nobody's got mobile phones to listen to the conversation. You know, they've made a cool $10 million or whatever it is. Um, the next question, he says, don't trust authority. Authority is vested interest in, in political outcomes or whatever the outcomes are of the conversation. And he says that AT&T at the time asked, uh, it was, I think it was 1993, asked how many of these devices are going to be in the general uh, public's use in 15 years' time. And of course, the think tank went off and did what they do, you know, they went to their parties and they collected their money and everything else. And they came back with um, 900,000. The true figure was 104 million. They were completely wrong off the planet. So one of the things that has come to me recently is because we've been getting bills about water and stuff like that. Um, there's a really fascinating uh, YouTube video of a man in Australia where I'm from, and he seems to have solved some real serious issues about water and how we deal with it in the landscape, and he basically goes, we've been doing it all wrong. And you can go and watch the video. But basically, um, I sent that <coughs> to the legislator who's dealing with the water issues, and I said, please look at this video before you do any more voting on some of the stories you're talking about, because it's very good stuff, and it's probably worth a lot for us to understand what's going on outside of this culture, but rather than what's going on inside internally. Um, and so, for a broader view, I'd like to see a, a room dedicated to people submitting testimony, video testimony that they download off the web. This is just very shallow thinking because I don't have it in the past few days. But uh, basically have a room where the young kids particularly who are talking about climate change and everything else can come in there and they can actually organize their testimony through the internet in that room coming together at the legislature in this um, architecture that we have here. Okay, thank you. So looking at ways that technology can also um, not only solve problems, but to engage with people to talk to their legislators so that they can um, reach them in new ways, whether it's through video testimony or through linking to other experts. Other thoughts on how technology may um, support civic engagement and public expression? Uh, I think it's very intriguing because you think of technologies, as you pointed out, that we didn't know were coming, and things that now dominate our lives, like the phone. I remember there's a, the great line, you know, in one of the movies about Microsoft, where it said, IBM said, oh, we'll make machines, who cares about the operating system, or mm -hmm. Edison, who wanted to sell movies by the foot, and hadn't taken <laughs> into account the theatrical value of certain films, and the best one, and I forget who it was, I think it was a oil minister from Saudi Arabia who once said, 
Um, the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so we can't see what things yeah. are coming our way, I suppose. Your, uh, your suggestion reminded me of, of, of one of my, my favorite, um, although maybe craziest idea to improve public policy, which is to, to, to somehow be able to harness this, this energy from, from inventors and citizens to, to quickly translate it into real public policy. And what I've always wanted to do was to create some sort of shark tank situation, right? You all know that show Shark Tank, where people come and pitch ideas to venture capitalists. Um, you know, the, they have good ideas, disruptive ideas, but they don't have the capital to get those done. And I, what I would love is to create some sort of policy innovation lab where citizens can come and pitch ideas for policy to the sort of people, legislators, academics, nonprofit folks, who can help them take this idea and then translate it into something that can become actual public policy. And I'd love to see government try to do a better job of embracing some of that energy. Um, I don't know if it would work, but you know that that's that that's my Collins crazy idea for for improving public policy. All you have to do is yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just need a forum. <laughs> uh, just just real quick to expand on that, maybe a hair. In that, for me, it seems like one of the big barriers um, in being maybe an a, a, a effective county council member is the lack of good local policy information out there. Right? We have all. You know, I want to get to zero carbon emissions as soon as possible and, and decarbonize our transportation sector. You know, and then when you look at, you know, places that are doing that successfully locally, it's, it's really hard to find some good examples of how to actually achieve that um, or, or how to reform our ADU policies. But, but so, so I think just, just turning that into a, you know, that there's, there's so much being focused at a state and federal level and so little being focused at a local level that we do need exactly what Colin's saying. I think Corinne's had a question for a while. <laughs> Where's Corinne? <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I guess my question, um, seeing that this is the future of civic engagement, last thing I wanted to just compliment you. This has been a incredible symposium, so well organized and um, such engaging speakers. Um, is that uh, the question that, uh, being that we are in this, what I've always felt is one of the most beautiful buildings, is why I came down here today, uh, in our city, is that the possibility of architecture. You know, um, I've always said that historic preservation is as close to a silver bullet as you can get for sort of the things that you're talking about, civic so engagement, um, kindness, civility, levels of uh, behavior. And as an elementary school teacher in my district of Lehigh, um, I'll never forget the time I took some of my kids who were from immigrant backgrounds and um, they were sort of um, being kids, they were avoiding normal kids and being sort of loud. And I brought them to one of the Aussie Pop jewels here in this mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, and I brought them into the Aussie Pop, and it was as if they had entered a temple. They hushed their voices on their own. They straightened themselves up. They looked around and became reflective. I really believe architecture is really no different than any kind of other art that we give so much attention to in social media. You know, I see so much written about in the about the Met Gala. Oh, so and so wore this. What a statement it made. Architecture to me makes the large, the biggest, most permanent, most important statements. And if you were to do a survey of regular people to come and, and observe all the different buildings here and give five adjectives. What do they feel when they feel there? They feel, wow, grand, stately. Um, then there are buildings such as on the Berkeley campus, which I recently visited. We went to the Bell Tower, and the you who have been to Berkeley. And you'll see that there's this beautiful mountain and beautiful architecture, and then there's the most hideous building you have ever seen. And the question becomes, what building is that? <laughs> <laughs> Ar architecture as as art form and way to inspire and elevate. Yes. <laughs> and fascist dictators' <laughs> architecture. And apparently, and I won't mention the building that is also in this neighborhood across from the Art Academy. That is a fascist architecture built in the eighties, literally on purpose, meant to make you feel small. Mm. Children are such great 
arbitrary <coughs> change. Then you know when they go to Disneyland, and Walt Disney was one of the greatest historic <coughs> preservationists. He actually recreated that one building on the end of Main Street, saved it, and recreated it, put it together. <coughs> they know beauty, they know grace, and they know what good architecture is. And I think that we need to put architecture at the core of solving these problems where buildings that require a standard <coughs> of behavior, a standard of grace, and that to me is what I would love to see discussion in on how we can take a vision of value architecture as something that's more than just a bunch of buildings. Great. Um, Thank you, Corinne. I mean, I'm going to have to cut you off, but I just do, I want to reinforce what she's saying, though, because we started out um, today asking people what their aspirations are for the capital and for the capital district, and there was a great deal of um, comment on being a place of inspiration, being a place of elevation, being a place where people will come and bring their best selves, and I think as we look at that relationship between the, the built environment and human behavior, I think that's, that's exactly what Corinne is getting at. Um, Bill, do you want to comment on any of that? Well, I would, one thought, Corinne, you've got to move with the times on preservation. You know, <laughs> there's now an organization called the Friends of Heroic Concrete that <laughs> celebrates <laughs> brutalism. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, if I would, if I had to characterize this building architecturally, I would say it has a little bit of brutalist influence too. But that said, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's been my field. I believe architecture transforms people. And I think it's, you know, you become what you wear in a way. And I think it's, it's important. That's why I think we need to have like third spaces, livable streets, places where people congregate places of architectural variety. One of my main criticisms as it kind of came across maybe in the slideshow was the kind of isolation of the capital from community. It becomes a kind of imposing piece of sculpture in the middle of a vast lawn. And of course that lawn masks the parking areas and back to the comment about disruptive technologies, I had a very nice interview with a young woman who was looking to get a job at UH the other day, and she said, self-driving cars are gonna change everything. Hmm. And that may be true. I mean, I, if you can imagine, you know, what might be going on in 20 years, we may not have that parking lot, right? Okay. Like, what's the parking, what, hey dad, why do you have a parking lot? What's that for? <laughs> But we, we have unfortunately been designing our cities a, a, around a hundred year old technology. So there may be a, a disruptive technology that changes everything. We're going to give everyone a chance to wrap up here. So any final thoughts? Colin, we'll start with you. Um, On the future of civic like engagement. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> let, let me narrow that a little bit. The future of civic engagement. Um, Look, for, for, for me, the future of civic engagement is, uh, and, and I'll just emphasize what I already said, to improve civic engagement, let's work on improving one thing we really can improve um, relatively easily, which is the quality and length of the civic education we give our students. So that's a concrete thing we can do. It doesn't cost a lot of money, and I think it will, um, it will pay benefits to us for, for obviously, for, for decades to come. Well, I'll skip. I had my last statement with oh, okay. self-driving cars. <laughs> Dad, right. what are those parking lots for? <laughs> uh, I was hoping to have a, uh, another minute there to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I'd go first. Yeah. Um, mm, so, you know, I, I said in my opening, you know, that, that it's important that we don't sort of put politics on a pedestal of civic and get a civic engagement. I do think it is vital, obviously, that everybody engage in some fashion, right? Just not in politics. Just everybody do whatever is is uh, uh, they feel capable of doing, and we need to create um, our communities that enable that. Just so, kind of to address the question from the woman over there, I don't know as much about architecture in general, but but I do more and more about zoning codes, right? And if we look at our all of our current sort of great old historic plantation towns in Hawaii or even around the country, all of these great walkable places and our 
in most of these places, um, zoning codes prohibit these places from being recreated as they are, right? We have minimum parking spaces everywhere that, that force us to build massive parking lots. Uh, we have, uh, on Kauai, you need a use permit if you're going to do any type of mixed use development in, in a commercial area, right? If you're going to put residential, right? So, so we're making these places impossible to rebuild. So we really need to, moving forward, you know, as you said, hey, how do we move away from our automobile-centric lifestyles, create communities that really uh, encourage connectivity at every level, um, get us off of our screens and get us in each other's faces so we can uh, fix all of these problems. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists for today. <laughs> so throughout the day, um, we've had a designated listener. Um, Representative Kyle Yamashita is a member of the task force, and he's been um, taking in much of this, this conversation, the, the presentations, the comments, the people talking in the hallway. And really, we, we asked him to give us some kind of closing thoughts and next steps, sort of where do we go from here? So on the 50th anniversary of the state capitol, looking forward, not only back into the present. So, Representative. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, aloha, everyone. Again, my name is Kyle Yamashita. I'm with the State House. I'm from Maui, and um, I was part of the task force. And uh, you know, um, they 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 worked really, really, really hard. Um, and I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, them for their hard work, um, led by our uh, chairman, uh, Senator Brian Taniguchi, who's out there, who spent a lot of time. Nice hand for Brian. Uh, there, um, we, we also like to thank um, all the speakers that uh, came out today and um, gave us a wide spectrum of, uh, you know, what the Capitol was uh, designed for and where, um, and its purpose, and then leading into the discussion of, uh, you know, open government and uh, more um, civics. You know, the, uh, on a personal note, you know, the, I, I kind of believe it in what uh, Colin was saying about the, um, uh, civic education, you know, one of the uh, things that I do is um, I'm involved with the Boy Scouts and one of the merit badges that I teach and I still teach is a citizenship in a community. And I'm surprised when I teach that is uh, how much they don't know. Um, and I think it's important that uh, more people could get out there and teach that um, um, the simple things. And, you know, what I do is um, it's a PowerPoint that we've created and we've altered the merit badge a little to tailor it to how our state operates and um, you know I think um, and I think even the adults who sit in the room and listen they're they're kind of um, unaware of how our state operates compared to every place else in the state I mean the nation so with that I think I think um, you know I think that part was very very uh, poignant to me so yeah, I just wanted to make that point. But, the, um, but also we'd like to thank all of you for um, giving up your Saturday and coming out, out today and participating. I think this is a great turnout, so we'd like to thank all of you for coming out. And then uh, and one more time, I think uh, we should give a nice round of applause to all our speakers who came out today and spoke to us. So. And then uh, Kirsten uh, Faulkner for facilitating this uh, great day. Thank you very much. And you know, I, I'm supposed to talk about you know what's the next step. So Senator Taniguchi talked about his 40 years in the uh, in the, uh, in this building, and I think um, you know uh, talking to him and his passion for everything. I think uh, we can uh, we can ask him to work into 50 years and continue his work on this. <laughs> But anyway, but uh, on a personal note, I also want to thank my wife um, for coming out uh, today. Um, March 15th is um, our anniversary, and I told her, you know, uh, how about spending? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'd like to thank her for, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, um, yeah, that was kind of like, okay, I forgot about that part, but that's our anniversary. <laughs> okay, so the, the next part is we're going to have a um, reception at Washington Place. I think, um, 
you know, uh, well, before I go there, you know, th there is some um, continuing work, I think, that needs to be done. This, this, um, this task force was created by, I, I think, Senators um, um, Bill, and, um, uh, and rightfully so. And I think, um, you know, um, going into the future, we, we, we need to further this discussion, educate people on what, the, what this building means, um, everything that you heard today, I think that's important. The task force is talking about um, taking those steps and how to take it out into the community. And so, if you have any input, um, you know, talk to Brian. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, anyway, so that's kind of important. Um, but again, going back to the reception, um, those of you that have RSPP um, is uh, immediately following this uh, to keep it kind of going. We're going to head over to Washington Place and um, have a reception there. Uh, hosted by uh, Governor Ige and uh, First Lady Don Amano Ige. So thank you very much for coming and uh, see you across the street. Thank you. Thank you.